μα θέμα είναι η εκδήλωση που διοργάνωσε το Macedonian Society of Great Britain με θέμα The Pan-Orthodoxy of Mount Athos. Ομιλητέ ήταν διακεκριμένοι επιστήμονε και ιστορικοί από διάφορα μέρη του κόσμου. Η εκδήλωση άνοιξε με χαιρετισμό από την Αντιπρόεδρο του Macedonian Society of Great Britain, κυρία Χρήστα Λαμπρινάκου, η οποία ευχαρίστησε του ομιλητέ αλλά και όλου του παρευρισκόμενου για το ενδιαφέρον που έδειξαν στο θέμα που αφορούσε το Άγιον Όρο. Ας παρακολουθήσουμε τη σύντομη ομιλία της. Your Eminence, Your Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen. I am Crystal Amrinakou, the Vice President of the Macedonian Society of Great Britain. On behalf of the Executive Committee, I would like to welcome you tonight. The Macedonian Society was founded in 1989 with the aim of promoting the Macedonian history and culture, and it is the main organization in the UK that informs, educates, Uh, at, that informs and educates the public about Macedonia, its history, its heritage. Today, the Macedonian society is a modern society that has a group of dedicated people willing to work hard to promote not only Macedonia, but Greece in general. The executive committee and me personally would like to thank the Levedis Foundation for their invaluable support over the years which allows us to continue our work. Also, we are particularly grateful to Levendis Foundation for the sponsorship of tonight's event. Without their support, this function could not have taken place. Also, we would like to thank Hellenic TV and Live Media Greece for offering to cover this event. We would like to thank the French of Mount Athos and especially Dr. Graham Speak for his help and advice. Also, we would like to thank our panelists for taking part in this event. Special thanks to Dr. Talbot, who traveled from the USA, and Mr. Rigopoulos, who traveled from Greece. The future of the society depends mainly on donations and memberships from our members and friends. As you know, we are a register, registered charity, and all our events are open to the public. So your support, either by donations or membership, will give us the tools to organize events like this one in the future. Our next event is on the 15th of December, a very prestigious Christmas ball held at the Five Star Royal Garden Hotel. Ακολούθησε η παρουσίαση των ομιλητών και των βιογραφικών τους από τον Αγαμέμνον Αποστόλο, ο οποίος παρουσίασε τους διακεκριμένους ομιλητές και το θέμα που παρουσίασαν. Ας παρακολουθήσουμε την παρουσίαση από τον κύριο Αγαμέμνον Αποστόλο. I'm going to speak about our, our panelists today and uh, a great uh, warm welcome to all of you who have made it here. Um, I'm going to start um, talking about each one's uh, achievements in life uh, up to this point and the topics they've talked to before uh, according to the order they're going to speak. Uh, first, uh, Graham Speak. Graham Speak is the founder and chairman of the Friends of Mount Tathos. He is a regular visitor to the Holy Mountain and was received into orthodoxy there in 1999. Trained as a classicist, he holds degrees from both Cambridge and Oxford and is a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries. He is the author of two books about Mount Athos. Mount Athos, first Mount Athos Renewal in Paradise, which won the 2002 Critical's Prize and its sequel a history of the Athenite Commonwealth, the spiritual and cultural diaspora of Mount Athos. Secondly, Constantinos Rigopoulos, who was graduated from Oxford Brookes University in Oxford with a Bachelor of Architecture degree. He received his diploma degree from the School of Architecture of the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki in Greece. He holds a Master of Science in Protection, Conservation and Restoration of Cultural Monuments from the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. Since 2007, he has been working at the Center of the Preservation of the Athenite Heritage, Kedak. His responsibilities are related to projects concerning restoration of the monuments of Mount Athos, and he has been recently appointed as Deputy Head in the Department of the Monument Conservation and restoration projects. Thirdly, Alice Mary Talbot, the only lady of our panel today. Uh, Dr. Alice Mary Talbot is a historian and has spent most of her career at Dumbleton Oaks, 
a research institute at Harvard University located in Washington, D.C. She served as an executive editor of the Oxford Dictionary of Byzantium and for 12 years as director of Byzantine studies. Her scholarly interests have focused on monasticism, hagiography, and women's studies. Her recent books include The Life of Saint Basil the Younger and The Holy Men of Mount Athos, a volume entitled Varieties of Monastic Experience in Byzantium between 800 and 1453, is currently in press at the University of Notre Dame. Um, fourthly, Douglas Dales is the Associate Anglican Priest in the East Downland Benefice uh, in the Diocese of Oxford. For many years, he was chaplain of Marlborough College. Married with three grown-up children, he was, has now written a number of books of early medieval history and also theology. He is a regular visitor of the Holy, Mount, of the Holy Mountain, Mount Athos, which he visits each year for a retreat at Latin Vatopedi and Simonopetra. In addition, his wife and he have both a strong friendship with the Orthodox monastery here in Essex, in England. And last but not least, Callistus Ware, Metropolitan Callistus of Dioclea, holds a doctorate in theology from the University of Oxford, where from 1966 to 2001, he was a fellow of Pembroke College and Spalding Lecturer in Eastern Orthodox Studies. He's a monk of the monastery of St. John the Theological in Patmos and an assistant bishop in the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of Thyatira and Great Britain. His publications include The Orthodox Church, third edition in 2015, and The Orthodox Way. And he is the president of the Friends of Mount Athos. Στη συνέχεια θα σας παρουσιάσουμε αποσπάσματα από δύο ομιλίες. Πρώτος ομιλητής ήταν ο Graham Speak, ο οποίος είναι ο συγγραφέας του βιβλίου The Friends of Mount Athos. Ας παρακολουθήσουμε ένα απόσπασμα από την ομιλία του, όπου παρουσιάζει μονές του Αγίου Όρους και την ιστορία τους. Um, 17 years have passed since I last addressed your society on the subject of Mount Athos. I had then visited the mountain ten times and been baptized there. I've now visited a further nine times and published two books about its history. Display copies are available at the back for anyone who's interested in them. The mountain has become my spiritual home. And like a swallow in the spring, I go back there as often as I can. This evening I was asked to talk to you about the history of Mount Athos, but in fact I'm going to speak about the pan-orthodoxy of the mountain. For me, it's the pan-orthodoxy of Athos that is the jewel in its crown, and it has been so throughout its history. Athos is in Macedonia, and Macedonia, as everyone here would agree, is in Greece. But Athos is not Greek. Athos is the spiritual heart of the entire Orthodox world. And if it were ever to lose its pan-Orthodoxy, it would lose the greater part of its raison d'etre. Anyone who's been there, or anyone who has had the pleasure of sailing round the peninsula, which anyone can do, will agree that it is pretty inhospitable territory. The further south you go down its coast, the rockier it gets, until at the southern tip, the mountain itself suddenly springs up out of the sea to a height of just over 2,000 meters. It's ideal country for the ascetic life. The first hermits came in the ninth century. They lived in caves or built themselves rudimentary huts 
often overlooking the sea like these at Carulia. Some of them are still there. They live amazingly austere lives, devoting themselves to prayer and scratching a meagre diet from the infertile soil. Not all the hermits live in such vertiginous locations. This is a cell probably inhabited by a small group of monks in rather pleasing countryside with its own olive grove at the foot of the mountain itself. Many monks still live in situations like this. They don't all live in the monasteries. Around the year 960, Saint Athanasius the Athenite came to the mountain. He was a native of Trebizond on the Black Sea coast of Asia Minor, and he came first as a hermit. But he was a charismatic character and was already a friend of Nikiforos Phokas, the future emperor, who wanted his company on an expedition to liberate Crete from Arab pirates. Athanasius agreed to go, and Crete was duly recovered for the empire. And on the strength of their Cretan spoils, the two men planned to found a monastery, and Nikiforos agreed to become a monk. Athanasius returned to Athos and started to build. But instead of a collection of cells of the sort that already existed on the mountain, what he built was this, the Great Lavra, a massive Cenobitic monastery, a bit like the Studios Monastery in Constantinople, inside a protecting circuit of high walls. Nothing of the sort had ever existed on Athos before. He equipped the monastery with a splendid church, which still stands, the church was completed in the year 963, and that date has been associated ever since with the foundation of the monastery. So, for example, it was in 1963 that celebrations were held for the millennium of Athos. Also in that year, 963, Nikiforos was crowned emperor, thus breaking his agreement to become a monk. But he continued to support the monastery with gifts, not only of money, but of relics and a generous annuity to secure its future. Athanasios also built a refectory for his brotherhood, which is behind this painted facade, and still contains its original marble-topped tables. Now, with a church and a refectory, the fathers had somewhere to worship together and somewhere to eat together, which gave them the basic facilities for a Cenobitic or common lifestyle. The monastery flourished, and by the end of the decade, the 960s that is, it had a brotherhood of 120 monks. Athanasios remained as abbot for nearly 40 years, during which time he acquired fame not only for his piety and his learning, but also his qualities as a ruler and pastor. A reputation that attracted monks from all over Eastern Europe and even further afield, from Georgia and Armenia in the East and from Italy in the West. During Athanasios' lifetime, Numerous other monasteries were founded on Athos. Not all of them survive, but of those that do, this one needs to be mentioned. This is Iveron, the monastery of the Georgians. Georgia was an independent kingdom outside the Byzantine Empire, but links between the two were close. And a group of Georgian monks had found their way to Athos and become disciples of Athanasios. In return for services to the emperor in war, the Georgians were granted generous sums of money 
as well as land on Athos suitable for the foundation of a monastery. And this is the result. The monastery was equipped with a large church, which stands in the middle of the courtyard, and a refectory. This is not the original one, of course. As well as a library, which still houses one of the richest collections on the mountain today. And the monastery soon became an important centre for the copying of manuscripts and for cultural exchange between Byzantium and Georgia. This lonely tower is all that remains of another remarkable institution on the mountain that came from outside the borders of the empire. This was the Benedictine monastery of the Amalfitans, founded before the end of the 10th century by monks from the city of Amalfi on the west coast of Italy. Στο βίντεο που ακολουθεί θα σας παρουσιάσουμε άλλη μια ομιλία από τον Μητροπολίτη Διοκλίας κύριο Κάλιστο, ο οποίος είναι πρόεδρος των φίλων του Αγίου Όρους. Ο Μητροπολίτης αναφέρθηκε στην ζωή των μοναχών στο Άγιο Όρος και την ιστορία τους. Ας παρακολουθήσουμε ένα απόσπασμα από την ομιλία του. I should like to speak now about the purpose of monasticism, whether on Athos or elsewhere. What is the monk here for? What is his essential task? And what service does the monk render to the Christian community or the world at large? Let me start with a modern answer by a Finnish Orthodox writer, Tito Colliander but his words apply to Athos. A monk was once asked, what do you do there in the monastery? He replied, we fall and get up, fall and get up, fall and get up again. There you have the idea that the monastery is a place of continual repentance of constant conversion. And that is not just a modern answer, but it is an ancient answer as well. We find it, for example, in a key text, the Gerontikon, or Sayings of the Desert Fathers, a text which is held in honor on Athos as elsewhere. For example, one of the Desert Fathers is asked by his disciple, why he sits alone in his cell and weeps. And he answers, I am weeping for my sins. St. Anthony, pioneer in the monastic life, says, this is a person's chief work, always to blame himself for his sins in God's sight. In Syriac, the term for a monk is a mourner, so the monk, looked at by himself, is the sinner, the poor man, defined not by what he does for others, but by his own need. A person comes to the monastery not because he makes any claim to transform society around him, but because he feels himself to be a sinner and is seeking salvation. St. Isaac of Nineveh, writing in the seventh century, is one who says, a monk is one who spends all the days of his life in hunger, thirst, and mourning for the sake of the expectation of the heavenly hope. That is a rather somber answer, what is the monk doing? And it may seem to be also a selfish answer. Does the monk care only about his own salvation without thought for the other members of the Christian family? So what services do the monasteries render to society, whether in Athos or elsewhere? 
A first feature that the monasteries perform, not very frequently, but sometimes, is evangelism. Some of the Athenite monks have gone out to preach the Christian faith, to go around as missionaries. One outstanding example of this is in the 18th century, St. Cosmas the Aetolian, who was a monk of Philotheu on the Holy Mountain. And he went out on a series of missionary journeys round northern Greece at a time when the Christian community at a, as a whole was at a low ebb. But most monks do not expect to leave Athos in order to go and preach the faith. Ολόκληρες τις ομιλίες μπορείτε να τις παρακολουθήσετε στο κανάλι μας στο YouTube και στην εκπομπή με το φακό του Hellenic TV. Thank you.